And today we are very honored to have uh, Mr. Ben Allen. Uh, he actually uh, lives not that far from us, from Twin City. It's about 80 miles away. And then uh, we, he actually also grew up from uh, Boston area, right? And I, I did my uh, graduate school in Boston area as well. So uh, uh, Ben is uh, author of uh, books with math cartoons. And then he also teaches math um, previously. And currently he's focusing on his forthcoming uh, math game with bad drawing books. And next fall, he's going to teach again in colleges. And uh, we really looking forward uh, to his seminar. Uh, I know for the two seminar speaker today is going to be a huge challenge because we're expecting couple hundreds of students from grade K to grade 12. I don't know how you guys are going to manage to make everyone satisfied. We'll see. Okay, Ben, your turn. Uh, I, I will stop sharing and then you can start sharing your screen. Sounds good. I will start sharing. Uh, let's full screen that. Come on. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, cool. All right. Hey, everybody. It's really good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be hanging out with you. Honored that you got up early on a Saturday morning to, to think about math and talk about math. Uh, and so uh, this is my talk. And as you can see, it's titled, this is not the title of the talk. Uh, just because I like I like a title to contradict itself. That's my uh, my main goal with the title is it should it should confuse the listener. They, they don't tell you that in uh, in school when they're teaching you to write books, but that's what you want from a title is confusion. Uh, and that cartoon also possibly a confusing cartoon right now. Why is the snake talking to the computer? I'm hoping by the end of our hour will uh, that that cartoon will make a little more sense. Uh, first, what I'm going to do since we have not quite the whole world in here, but like. I don't know, you guys are, what, 250 of you right now? Let me check the number at the moment. Oh, 271 participants. Okay, so it's not all 8 billion people on Earth, but we're getting close. Um, even so, I do want to hear where people are coming from. So let me briefly turn back on the, uh, the chat. And now it should be on. I believe. So go ahead and tell us what's your name, where I guess we can see your name, where you're coming from. Cool. We got Minnesota, Toronto, Texas, all the great places. Rochester, cool. Somebody local preparing for spam. <laughs> Iowa, cool. So some place named Jennifer and I. Oh, Jennifer is the person and Iowa is the place. That makes more sense. I thought there was a town called Jennifer, Iowa, which would be cool. New Jersey, Massachusetts. So Lexington is right next to the town where I grew up. Uh, Minnesota, Minnesota, Texas, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Amazing. I like how you're all given the location, but nobody's given the thing they love about math. That, that's okay. I guess it's faster to type where you're from. Uh, everything about math except graphing, fair logic puzzles, cool. We have Michigan, we have California, we have Rochester, we have Massachusetts. Math in general, I love that. Just all the things about math. Mars, beautiful place to be from. I mean, it's dry, dry, but lovely. You know, the color of the soil is really literal equations, cool. New Jersey, exponents. Interesting, okay, Gavin from New Jersey really loves exponents, differential equations, a beautiful branch of mathematics. Oh, thank you, Helen, for reading my books. Quadratics, Texas. I like to think that possibly someone is from the city of quadratics and someone else, their favorite thing about math is Texas. It's possible. Uh, congruence, Arizona, algebra, okay, amazing. I'm going to turn off the chat in a moment. I realize possibly not everyone has gotten a chance to share their love, but... I'm gonna stop it there. Exponents, Florida, Texas, cool. All right, well, thank you, that was fun. That felt to me like turning on a fire hydrant and just getting this like torrent of information from you delightful people out there in the world. So thank you for sharing your, uh, yeah, your, where, where you're coming from with me. Um, and this is something at the end of the slide on the last slide, I'll show my email um, and my website. And so if you would like to have more of a one-on-one -on -one interaction with me at some point without you know 249 other people listening in, uh, feel free to send me an email. I always love talking to students. Okay, so today we've got, I should check the time. Okay, we've got another, well, let's say 45 minutes. And in those 45 minutes, we're gonna be really efficient. We're gonna do five adventures. That's about nine minutes per adventure. I think we can pull it off. Uh, to me, this is what math is about. Math is about adventures. The cool thing you do with math is you start with one idea, a simple idea, like a triangle. And then suddenly it starts multiplying and multiplying. You combine triangles, you're making squares, you're making higher degree polygons. And from a little simple starting place, you can go on a huge adventure. So I'm gonna show you five quick adventures. First, I wanna tell you about just like my own adventure as a teacher, and why I like teaching and what brought me into teaching. Uh, then 
the most important thing you can do with mathematics, like literally the most important thing, forget the economy, forget physics, it's brownies. Um, humans were put on this earth to make brownies and mathematics can help us do that. Uh, then we'll have a light little, you know, just a little interlude where we'll go on an adventure on a giant spaceship that destroys planets. Um, always fun for a laugh. Uh, then we'll get serious for a minute and I'll, we'll do some logic puzzles um, inspired by, that's actually not a picture on the right-hand side there. That's not meant to be a lying politician. That's Raymond Smullyan, who wrote some really fun books about mathematics and full of puzzles. Um, and so I wrote a few puzzles kind of in his honor. Uh, and then finally, we'll come back to that first picture um, and to the title of the talk, and we'll talk about paradoxes, which is, that's one of my favorite things in mathematics, because paradoxes are when it's like the whole universe stops making sense. And there's nothing more fun than that. I love it when the universe stops making sense. So first, uh, the adventure of the teacher, that, that's me. So I'm, I'm, even though right now I'm spending all my time writing books, and so I haven't been able to do much teaching the last few years, uh, I love teaching. I love hanging out with students, even little tiny digital rectangle students like you guys on the screen. Um, always a pleasure to see you. So, you know, why did I get into teaching? To me, it was three things. Um, one is I love ideas and teachers get to share ideas. Uh, two is I love people too. And, and people are good at thinking about ideas. And three is that I love psychology and I love seeing how people think about ideas. Uh, and so I thought math teaching would be a cool way to get to, to practice all of those things. Now, what I found, though, is that for a lot of people, stuff like this does not make them happy to see. And now you guys are all awake bright and early on a Saturday morning, so I expect that you guys enjoy seeing mathematical symbols on a page. Um, but what I found is you would show something like this to students. And to me, this is like a tricky puzzle, sort of interesting question about numbers and their relationships. And I would show this to students and they would see something more like this. And I understood why that made them upset because that's, you know, that, that looks kind of scary. Um, or I would show them something like this, x squared versus two to the x. And to me, these are so different. These are completely different. I can't imagine two things more different than x squared and two to the x. Um, oh, I see hands in the air. Yeah, oh, it would be fun. I would love to get to call on students. If we were in a classroom, I would call on students, but unfortunately being in this giant digital space of, you know, almost, was it almost 300 of us now? Um, oh yeah, we're getting close to 300. I, I'll just have to sort of talk this through. But so X squared, I'll let you think about this for a second. We'll play it like, like Blue's Clues or one of those TV shows where you're talking back to the TV. Um, so X squared, we think, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means x times x, a number times itself. So say if x were 100, it would be 100 times 100. Right? That's what the little 2 means. Um, what about 2 to the x? Well, again, if x were 100, just to give an example, that would mean right? that little x up there, would 2 to the 100th power, that would mean 2 times 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 2, 100 times. So these are both pretty big numbers, right? 100 times 100, that's big. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 100 times, also big. But they're not the same kind of big. Because 100 times 100, that's 10,000. Okay, that's pretty big. That's like if you, uh, I don't know, that's like the weight of like maybe a couple of pickup trucks. Yeah, like two or three pickup trucks. That's pretty heavy. Um, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That is, uh, well, that number. So that's a 10 to the 30 or so, that's about a non-nillion, um, which if you had a non-nillion pounds, that would be the weight of like 100,000 Earths. So these are so different. I look at these two things and they feel so different to me. And I wanted to help students see how different these were. But when I would show things like this to students, I feel like they would look at it and they would see this. And I would be like, look how different they are. They're so different. That one's big, but that one's huge. And my students would be like, is the blue and the or I don't know. They look the same, man. What are you, what are you talking about? Um, and what I realized, and I, I, I still enjoyed sharing these ideas, and I found that with time, students could start to see it um, and have it feel meaningful to them. Um, but what I decided students needed was they needed adventures. They needed a chance to go out and have these things not just be symbols on a page, but be meaningful, I don't know, like, like the, as though the math was telling them a story. Um, and so what I started doing was I started writing books that tell stories about mathematics. 
Um, and so this is my first one. It is uh, blue. Um, it's called Math of Bad Drawings. And it's just about, um, I don't know, different places math shows up in the world. And a few of the adventures we'll go on today come from this book. Um, and then I wrote another book called uh, Change is the Only Constant. And that one's about calculus. So those of you who are mentioning differential equations and multivariable calculus in there, um, there's you know, little bits and pieces of that in, in that book. Um, and that book is, you'll notice, red. Um, so, so far I've written two different colors of books. I have a yellow book coming out in, uh, in next year in 2022. Um, and I hope someday to write a whole, whole rainbow of books. That was my life goal. Um, and you know, I'd like the books to have good information inside them, but really the most important thing is the color. Uh, and so, oh, and here's, I also do some cartoons on the internet and things like that. So this is one that uh, uh, you may have even come across this as making the rounds a week or two ago, which is, I won't, we won't go through all the details here, but uh, how to pick what you'd like to study in college. Um, and be warned, these are these are somewhat cynical jokes, not uh, not totally serious. I think all of these are beautiful fields, um, but it's more fun to make fun of them. So I do a lot of making fun of them. Okay, that is our first adventure, uh, my adventure. This adventure we can all go on. Um, and this is the adventure of making brownies, which is, as I, as I say, life's greatest and, and truest adventure. Um, so there we have some brownies. Beautiful. Now, I want you to imagine that we are trying to make brownies, and the recipe calls for an 11-inch by 7-inch pan. Uh, and that seems, oops, let me make adjustment. Uh, let's see. So 11-inch by 7-inch pan. Um, and let's say we don't have an 11 inch by seven inch pan. We look in the cupboards, we look in the basement, we look in people's bedrooms, even though that's not really where you keep brownie pans. Uh, and we find that we only have this giant pan, 22 by 14. So too big for the brownie recipe that we have. And so a question one might ask is what do we do, right? With this too big brownie pan. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what we might do with our too big brownie pan. So let me turn on the chat and let you share your thoughts on what we should do uh, given that we don't have the brownie pan we need. Just, I uh, see, look at that. Yeah, I like, uh, I like some people are saying we should cut this big brownie pan into smaller pieces. Um, and I'm seeing a few different possibilities, right? I'm seeing just eat it all, right? Just make a giant brown pan of brownies needed at all. Yeah, so I'm seeing a few numbers come up a lot. I'm seeing numbers like a half and I'm seeing numbers like a quarter. Cool, Oof. Oof, man, it really is. It's like, it's as though it's like turning on Instagram and just seeing like everybody's posts on Instagram so the words go flying by. Very exciting, it's faster than I can read. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause the chat again. Thank you for sharing your lovely thoughts. There are indeed 300 people here. Okay, so. I think a natural first answer, and, and many of you saw past this kind of first thought, but a natural first thought is to say, well, okay, it's 22 by 14, it's twice as big. But as some of you were pointing out, it's not really twice as big. I mean, in a sense it is, it's twice as long and it's twice as wide. But what that means is, right, twice as long means it's already twice as big. Twice as wide means it's twice as big again. So it's really four times as big. Uh, and so this is a really deep property of mathematics. If you scale something linearly, so you multiply its linear dimensions by say five, then the area gets multiplied by five and five again, 25. Um, and this is actually something, if you ever study fractal geometry, this is like almost the essence of what dimension means. Like what is, what is a dimension? What does it mean? Well, it's when you multiply something to make it bigger, how many times bigger does the whole object get? Uh, cool, so that's sort of interesting. All right, now let's suppose that we, and this is where it gets, it gets quite important because um, it seems like, I think if you just look at this, like, okay, twice as big is twice as big. I don't know, it's like, it's the same thing fundamentally, just different sizes. But I'm gonna argue that that's not necessarily the case. So let's imagine, okay, we, we've got our giant brownie, brownie pan, we make our four times as much brownie batter. So we've got a huge thing. We just use like 12 eggs to make brownies. And then we realize, oh, you know what we forgot to do? We forgot to check the uh, basement. No, we did check the basement. We forgot to check the attic. 
And so we go up to the attic and actually we have four little brownie pans that are exactly the right size for the original recipe. And so we're like, oh, that was stupid. We made this giant thing of brownies when we did have the right pan, if we just looked for it. So now we've got two choices. We can either use that giant pan, the 22 by 14, or we could take our brownie batter and pour it into those four little pans, right? So instead of doing one giant pan, do four little pans of brownies. And my question is, does it make a difference? Do we care? Um, and once again, I'm going to briefly turn on the chat and allow you guys to share your thoughts on whether it makes a difference. Okay. So yeah, no difference. Some, some people are saying maybe it takes longer. Um, oops, yeah, I'm seeing a few. Most of the answers going by are no. They're going by too fast for me to read them. Um, I'm seeing occasional people saying, you're right, it might take longer, different cooking times could be, right? It might, might be easier to fit the smaller ones into the oven. I think that's a nice point. Giant pan might not fit in the oven. We're gonna need a big oven. Um, okay, interesting. And now I'm seeing a few people start to mention the same issue. Okay, I'm going to cease the, uh, there we go. In fact, right where I stopped it, it's just like, like stopping a roulette wheel as it spins. Um, there is one crucial difference I think that's worth thinking about here, which is easiest to see if I look at a picture. So here, here's a picture of the four pans all put together and the one giant pan. Uh, so think about that giant pan, look at those brownies. Um, how many corner pieces are there in that giant pan? Well, four, because that's how rectangles work. So there's four corner pieces. Uh, and then what else do we have? We've got a fair number of pieces along the edge. So if you count those up in the picture, you'll get 24 edges. And then there's all the pieces in the middle. Um, and it turns out it's mostly middle pieces. But what about the other one? You're not going to get the same numbers here, right? How many corner pieces in four pans? Well, there's four in each corner. So 16 corner pieces. And then edge pieces, well, let's see, we've got a bunch, eight edge pieces in each of the little pans, so 32 edges. But it's the same number of pieces overall, so you only get 16 centers. So there's something different here, right? It's the same amount of brownies, but this one is sort of an edge heavy way of doing things. And this one is a center heavy way of doing things. It's mostly center. And this is actually a really weird property of shapes in general. Small shapes and big shapes are never just the same version of different things. Small is different than big. It's just fundamentally different because smaller things have more surface area compared to their interior. And big things have more interior compared to their surface area. And it's just because when you make something bigger, right? If you were to take me and make me twice as tall, so I'm now, how tall am I? Let's see, I'm between five and a half and six feet now. So I'd be almost 13, oh, yeah, over, no, 11 to 12 feet. Yes, I'd be between 11 and 12 feet tall if you doubled me, right? So I'd be quite big. I'd be a great asset to your basketball team. Just pass me the ball and I like drop it right in because I'm taller than the hoop. Um, but I would be a totally different creature. It wouldn't just be me, but twice as big. I would have four times as much skin, weird to think about, but there would be eight times as much internal organs. And in fact, the reason you don't see people this tall is my muscles would be, let's see, my muscles would be four times as strong, but I would be eight times as heavy. So I would be trying to walk around and just collapsing under the weight because my muscles wouldn't be strong enough. And so when you double something in size, even though it kind of looks the same, especially if you zoom out, it looks the same. It just isn't. It's different. It's a different object. Uh, and that's one of the essential lessons of brownies. Now, here we come to the very important question. Um, and I got to turn on the chat again for this. Do you prefer the edge heavy approach? or the center heavy approach? Do you guys want those crispy edge brownies with a little bit a little bit of crisp on it? Or do you want the gooey soft center brownie? Um, I'm gonna turn on the chat and this, this is, you know, is it the most important question in human life? Yeah, probably. Okay, we got votes for center edge. Oh, interesting. Oh, it's already divisive here. Edge, crisp, edge, center, center, edge. Um, okay, okay. I appreciate the people saying goo brownies. 
we got people saying crisp, we got people saying edge. Wow, this is much more evenly divided than I might have guessed. Okay, a lot of different opinions here, a lot of opinions. Crisp, 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 both. Both, I, I admire both. I think both is a very balanced way to approach it. Okay, all right. I'm gonna pause the giant chat again. Full pan. I think full pan is a great answer too. Just eat the whole pan. Um, now, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, uh, everyone who said edge is is just wrong. It's got to be center. You want those gooey center brownies. And I'm, I'm sorry, you edge people. I'm sure you're beautiful people in every way, but you and I, we just disagree on this. Um, and here's what's really sad for me, center people like me, is it's easy to get more edge, right? More edge, all you have to do, in fact, you can buy special brownie pans like this. All you have to do is add more surface area, right? Add more perimeter. And there's lots of ways to do that, right? You see, you can add right, this, this one over here, like breaks the brownies down into tiny little bite-sized ones. You can make it a zigzag shape. You can kind of add more, oh, actually that one. Yeah, it, it does, that adds more, more edge total. Um, there's lots of things you can do, but if you want more center brownie, you are kind of stuck. Mathematics doesn't let us make more center brownie without edge, you need some edge. And so a square is honestly pretty good the very best you can do, if you try to picture what's the shape that has the very least edge, you might be able to think of it, the very best you can do for 2D shapes is gonna be a circle that has the least edge you can do. Um, but really the best you can do uh, if, you're, if you're a center person like me is just make a bigger pan of brownies. That's your only move. You're not gonna find a better shape than a circle. You can't do any tricks like these special pans you can buy. So you are just stuck making a bigger pan of brownies. Um, but luckily we at least do have that solution. We can just make giant, giant pans of brownies, which has the other benefit of then you have lots of brownies. Okay, that is our second adventure. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Perfect, cool. Um, now on to the adventure of the Death Star. Uh, are you folks familiar with the uh, film franchise known as Star Wars? Can I get some nods if, uh, if that sounds familiar to you? Okay, it may, it may have crossed your path. It's uh, they like they sell billions of tickets. Um, very popular film franchise. So I was curious as I was thinking about Star Wars, and this is when I was, I was writing my first book, and I was thinking, isn't it weird that they have a giant spherical space station? You don't really see that anywhere, right? Other books, other movies, they don't tend to do spheres. Um, so let me ask you guys first, actually, and I'll turn on chat again. Uh, if you were designing a giant space station, what shape would you pick? How would you design your space station? Um, and let me go ahead and turn on chat. So tell me, what shape would you go for? We got spheres, polygons, pentagons, pyramids, rhombuses, Pikachu shaped, like the droid ones, cool. Whew. Triangles, rotational symmetries, streamline it, very cool. Icosahedron, blobby triangles. Okay, a lot of good options. Donut shaped, pipe shaped. Okay, these are these are great options. Cool. I'm gonna pause it right there. So I uh, yeah, a lot of interesting ideas. I think when you guys, you know, together, and frankly, there's enough of you, 306 of us in here, we can definitely conquer the galaxy. Um, and then I think we can have a debate about what kind of space station we want to use. Uh, my feeling, so I was, I was thinking about this and I was thinking like, okay, imagine you go to the emperor, you go to Darth Vader and you say, okay, what kind of shape do we want space station to be? Um, now pyramid is appealing to me. Uh, on the other hand, pyramid, I don't know, pyramid is kind of taken. Pyramid is this very classic shape by the Egyptians. And in fact, this is a, a different chapter in, in my first book. I got to research, you know, how did they build those pyramids and what was it like? And it's really impressive how precise the pyramids were given how long ago they were built. Um, you know, the sides are almost exactly the same length. The corners are almost perfect right angles. Um, anyway, so point being though that ancient Egyptians kind of took the, uh, the pyramids. So I figure Darth Vader doesn't want a pyramid shape. Um, another option is a cylinder. I think cylinders are cool. We sometimes build cylindrical buildings. Um, but then I drew the picture and I was like, you know what? It's a hockey puck. Nobody's running from a hockey puck. Nobody's super scared of the big galactic hockey puck. So I thought, okay, that's probably not going to work. Um, then I thought, I started looking at some 
more obscure geometric shapes. And I was like, ooh, a stellated icosahedron. That's a nice one. Icosahedron is a platonic solid. You throw in these kind of stellated protuberances. That seems cool. But, you know, then I thought about it. This empire, they don't seem that good at building stuff. And that looks like a very complicated building project. So maybe they could pull it off. But I figure they're going to want something simple, something classic. And that's where the sphere comes in. And then, so I've got two other thoughts on the Death Star. Uh, and the first one was, there's the cool moment, right? I was thinking of like, why does the Death Star, why does the sphere work as a shape? And if you think about it, if you look around the galaxy, if you look around the universe, sphere tends to mean big, right? The sun is a sphere, the earth is a sphere, the moon is a sphere. Mars's moons, which are much smaller than our moon, only about, you know, our moon is a thousand miles across, Mars's are only a few miles across. Those are not spheres. So if you look in the cosmos, it tends to be the biggest, heaviest, most massive shapes that are spheres. And you, so you get this moment in the first Star Wars movie where, uh, typo in there, Obi-Wan Kenobi, not Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, but he, they look at the space station and they say, oh, let's go over to that moon. And they go, oh, that's no moon. And so I think that's part of the point of having a giant spherical space station is it just seems so large. It seems like planets and stars and other things that become spheres. Which to me raises the question of like, why is that true? Why do they become spheres? And the answer is gravity. Yeah, if you have your, I'm sure there are folks out there who could, uh, who could give this answer just as well as I can. Um, but the idea is that if your shape is really small, right, the more matter there is, the more mass there is, the stronger the gravity is. So if you have a small shape, then the gravity isn't really strong enough to pull it together. That is why, I don't know if you have ever held a potato in your hand, but a potato does not get pulled into a sphere. A potato can just sit there as a nice, silly potato shape, and gravity will not turn it into a perfect sphere. On the other hand, if it's big enough, if you had a potato that was, let's say, about 500 miles across, I think is what you'd need. Yeah, about 500 miles diameter. There would be so much potato in the interior that the gravity would start to really matter, right? Right now, the potato in your hand just has a tiny, tiny amount of gravitational pull. If it was 500 miles wide, then it would start pulling. Stuff close to the center where there's already things in the way, it can't really get pulled any closer. But the things that are far away and where there's place for them to kind of settle down will get pulled in and you'll wind up with something much closer to a sphere, which is why the earth is a sphere. Uh, and of course, if the gravity is too strong, then things start to collapse in and you get what is known as a black hole. So What's interesting about this, I did my homework and I looked up how big the Death Star is. And the Death Star is, according to all the best sources, like maybe 100, 150 miles wide, which actually isn't big enough usually to become a sphere. Um, the Death Star would, left to its own devices, you know, if you just built an asteroid that size, it would just stay a lumpy potato shape. Gravity wouldn't be strong enough to pull it together. So in a way, the fact that the Death Star is a sphere is like the Death Star pretending to be bigger than it is, right? An actual moon that size would not become a sphere, but the Death Star is a sphere. So what it reminds me of more than anything is a pufferfish. It's a creature pretending to be larger than it is to try to scare people. So next time you see the Death Star, if you ever find yourself flying through space, being frightened of, uh, of these enormous planet-destroying lasers, just picture a pufferfish and think, eh, it's not really so scary. Uh, and that is, by the way, the, just to remind you, the name of my blog is Math of Bad Drawings. So please excuse my, my pufferfish, uh, which looks, I don't even know what that looks like. It's, like a, it's had a very bad haircut, that's what it looks like. Okay, um, next thought, and this is my final thought on the Death Star. Um, so the Death Star, if you've seen the movies, looks really crowded when you go walking around the Death Star. Looks like it's pretty full. Um, so let's compare it to some other places. An elevator has a density of about 3 million people per square kilometer. Elevator is a very crowded place. A submarine is about 50,000 people per square kilometer. New York City, if you just take the whole city, is about 10,000 people per square kilometer. Suburbs, think about they're more spaced out. 
So only about 1,000 people per square kilometer. If you look at the whole state of Hawaii, uh, that's only about 90 people per square kilometer because Hawaii has some cities, but it also has lots of big empty spaces. And so my question for you is, so the Death Star, actually, so I looked it up, the Death Star has about 2 million people on it. Depends on whether you're counting the droids. And so my question, and I'll open up chat again, is uh, how dense do you think the Death Star is, right? Think about those scenes with all the people running around on the ship. They're trying to sneaking around, trying to avoid the stormtroopers. How dense do we think the Death Star is? We've got a range of answers. We've got pretty dense, not dense. We've got 5,000, maybe like a suburb. Maybe like a few dozen, 5,000 people, 3,000, one, similar to Hawaii. Okay, this is, we got, we've got a range of answers here. Um, yeah, okay, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, so here I, I ran the numbers. I said, okay, we know how big the Death Star is. It's about a 70 mile radius. We know how many people there are. It's like 2 million people. And so divide how many, if you put everybody up on the surface, how dense would it be? And the answer is, about 30 people per square kilometer, which is sort of like West Virginia, which must mean that most of the Death Star is empty because the parts we see are very crowded with people. So strangely, and this, I guess this makes sense. You don't want to show this in a movie, but the Death Star must have miles and miles and miles where like just nothing has happened. And maybe you got one droid in like surrounded by 10 empty football fields of nothingness. And really, if you think about it, it's even worse than that, the Death Star, because it's not all on the surface, right? The Death Star is deep. People live on the inside. So even if you just imagine they're only maybe a thousand layers deep, say they live in the top kilometer, so they're mostly living on the surface, then you're down to only three hundredths of a person for every hundred kilometers, 10 by 10 kilometers square, there's only three people in it. So the Death Star is basically empty. And the only emptier thing I can think of is if you've ever seen the book or read the, or seen the book, seen the movie or read the book of The Martian, uh, that's where there's one person trapped on Mars and he had more space to spare. But the Death Star would be, you know, just about the emptiest thing, the side of Mars. It would be very quiet there. And so that gives me the other thing. You can think of the Death Star as a puffer fish or you can think of it as basically West Virginia, but floating in space. It's also about the same size, same population as West Virginia. So when I think of the Death Star, I now think of West Virginia floating around in space. Okay, uh, this brings us to adventure number four. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, yeah, yeah we got time for this adventure. Okay, adventure number four, um, the adventure of the Democrats and the Republicans. You guys have been doing a lovely job of listening to me just ramble and tell you about uh, stuff I like thinking about. This one, I've got some logic puzzles for you. So these logic puzzles are inspired by a wonderful writer of books named Raymond Smullyan, who he passed away a few years ago. Um, but I like it. What he said before he died was he said, why should I worry about dying? It's not going to happen in my lifetime, um, which I think is a very admirable attitude and, and true. Uh, and you can sort of see in that, in that joke that he was, he was really interested in logic. That was what he loved more than anything was logic. And so you may have actually seen his, his puzzles. They're the ones that are something like you come into a road where everybody is either someone who always lies or always tells the truth. And then you have to figure out what do you ask the person, you know, to figure out which, which way to go on the road. So I decided this just after he died and I'd just been reading some books of his. Um, oh, you, know, you guys know that puzzle. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's fun. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you, if you like that puzzle, I'm going to give you some, uh, some other puzzles that are very similar in style and we'll, we'll share the answers in chat. Um, so I decided let's try to write some puzzles like his, but I figured let's make it a little bit different. Instead of having people who always lie and people who always tell the truth, let's have two types of people. And I said, well, what do we call the two types of people? I said, well, okay, we're here in the US. Let's call them Republicans and Democrats. And Republicans tell the truth to other Republicans, but they lie to Democrats. So they tell the truth to their own party, but they lie to the opposite party. And Democrats will do exactly the opposite or the same, I guess. They'll tell the truth to other Democrats, but they're gonna lie to Republicans. 
So each party tells the truth to each other. If it's your same party, you tell the truth. But if it's the opposite party, you lie. And now let's imagine we're wandering around and we overhear some conversations. Now we are new to the area, so we don't know who are the Democrats, who are the Republicans. But my question is just by listening in on them, can we figure out who is speaking? And can we figure out who is listening? So let's, let's try a couple of these. I've got five puzzles for you. You guys ready to try some puzzles? Okay, so I'll have you, I'll, uh, I'll let you think about it. Get ready to type the answer in chat if you can come up with an answer. And then uh, after that, I'll open up chat so you can share your thoughts. So let's say we are walking along, just, you know, mind our own business, maybe listen to headphones. Let me kind of peel off our headphones. Go, okay, well, what are people talking about? And we see someone say to someone else, we are from the same political party. Now, here's my question, right? Now, Democrats tell the truth to other Democrats, but they lie to Republicans. Republicans do the opposite. They tell the truth to Republicans and they lie to Democrats. Can we tell who's who in this situation? Can we tell who is speaking to who? Or what can we conclude? Do we know, are they from the same party? Are they from different parties? What do we think? So take a second to think about that. Okay, and now why don't you go ahead and in chat, see if you've got a thought on what we can tell. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of no, can't tell, can't tell, can't tell. No, we don't know, we don't know. Some people say maybe we do know that they're different. Can't tell, can't tell. Okay, a lot of no's, no, 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 no. Wow, yeah, a lot of, a lot of no's. Whew, yeah, to me, that's like, if you just saw the answers, you'd be like, wow, Ben must have asked a really obnoxious question. I was <laughs> just saying, no, 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 no. Um, so let's think it through. Now, what if they were from the same political party? Then it's true. And you tell the truth to someone from your same party, so, so they might say that. But what if they were from different parties? Well, then they'll lie, right? If a Republican is talking to a Democrat or a Democrat to a Republican, they'll lie and they'll say, we are from the same political party. So we can't conclude anything. They always say that. Whether they're talking to the same person or the other party, they're always gonna say that. This is the kind of thing they always say. So I'm with you guys saying, no, we can't really conclude anything. Here's question two. So we're, we're, we keep walking along and we hear someone say to someone else, well, you and I are from different parties. We're from different parties. So here's my question is, can we conclude anything from that? What does that tell us? If we hear someone say, we are from different parties. Yeah, I'm seeing a few, I see he is an alien. I see people saying impossible contradiction, question mark, no, they are weird. Paradox, paradox, question mark, question mark. The person saying that is a double agent. I like that. Maybe a third party voter. Could be someone from the Green Party or the Libertarian Party. Someone gone bonkers. Okay, all right. Let's, let's think that through. So we're from different parties. Now imagine if they were from the same party, right? If they're from the same party, then they tell the truth. So they would never say that. They would never lie like that. So they must be from different parties, right? But wait, if they were from different parties, then they would lie to each other. And this would be the truth. So they would never say that to each other, right? If it was a Democrat talking to a Republican, they would never tell the truth like this. They would lie and say, we are from the same party. So I'm with you guys who said paradox. They never say this. This never comes up. We must be hallucinating. We must have heard something different or maybe we misheard or maybe it's a double agent. Maybe it's an alien. I don't know. But that's not something they would ever say. No one would ever say this on this island. Okay, third conversation. We're walking along, we're walking along, and we hear one person say to the other, you are a Republican. You are a Republican, they say. They point the right in the face and they say, you are a Republican. And the question is, what can we conclude? Do we know, is it true that that person is a Republican? Is it false? What about the person who's talking? What can we figure out? So take a minute. Oh, I forgot to close the uh, chat. Oh, no, I didn't. Here we go. So chat's open again. Hmm, yeah, so we've got a few, can't conclude, both Republican maybe. 
let's see, speaker is Republican. No, 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 Republican, Republican, Republican. I see some ah, ah, ah answers. They must walk away. Okay, they must both be the same thing. Okay, all right, so I see a lot of answers coming through. And we've got, we've got some more varied answers on this. I see some people saying you can't conclude. Let's, let's just think this through step by step. Okay, so could one Republican say this to another? Uh, sure, sure, because it would be true and that would be fine. Could a Republican say this to a Democrat? Let's think, would a Republican say to a Democrat? That wouldn't be true, but Republicans lie to Democrats. So a Republican could say it to a Democrat because it would be a lie. Could a Democrat say it to a Republican? No, because it would be the truth and Democrats lie to Republicans. And could a Democrat say it to a Democrat? Uh, let's see, it would be a lie. So no, that wouldn't happen. A Democrat wouldn't lie to another Democrat. So this is sort of a funny thing. What we conclude, if you just look at the four possibilities, if someone points at the other person and says, you are a Republican, we have no idea if the person they're pointing at is. But the person doing the pointing, that's a Republican. Because only a Republican would call someone else a Republican. That is very weird. I find that tricky. All right. This adventure, I had two more questions, but I think I'm just going to zip through these because I want to get to our final adventure. Um, similar, I'll just, guess, I'll just guess think about this one. Actually, let me sort of skip ahead. Um, so I am a Republican is another one worth thinking about. Uh, let me skip through that. And at least one of us is a Democrat is the final puzzle. But I want to get through to our last adventure here. Um, so thank you for playing along with those puzzles with me. We are almost at the end of our hour. So let's do our final adventure. And this is one that that last adventure kind of leads into this because this is all about paradoxes. Um, and here's another story from Raymond Smalling. This is one of my favorite stories of his. Long time ago, well, almost a hundred years ago because um, he was born a long time ago. This is when he was six, five or six years old. So he was sick in bed and you might notice that date, 1st of April, 1925. What is the 1st of April? Uh-oh, it is April Fool's Day. So in the morning, my brother Emil, who is 10 years older than Raymond, came into his bedroom and said, well, Raymond, today is April Fool's Day, and I will fool you as you have never been fooled before. Which, when you are six years old, the last thing you want is a 16-year-old coming in and saying, I'm going to fool you so bad. As a frightening thought. So Raymond waits all day. He's sick in bed. He's just lying there, nervous. He's going to fool me. He's going to fool me. What's he going to do? But he never did anything. Emil never came, never came back, never did anything. And then Raymond realized, what if that was the trick? What if that was the fooling? He fooled me into thinking he was going to fool me. But then he didn't fool me. Wait a second, but that means he did fool me because he said he wasn't going to fool me and that fooled me. Wait, but if he did fool me, then, then what was the fooling? Because he said he was going to fool me, then he did fool me. That's not a fooling. And so Raymond went back and forth around, I recall lying in bed long after the lights were turned out, wondering whether or not I had really been fooled. And in some ways, Raymond went off and wrote some great books you guys should check out. One of them is called, This is Not the Name of This Book, or This is Not the Title of This Book. Um, there's another one called To Mock a Mockingbird, which is one of my favorites. Um, and he wrote a lot of books that were kind of all about this kind of puzzle. If you have something referring to itself, if the trick is that there is no trick, or the title is that there is no title, things kind of stop making sense. So here's one of my favorite sentences that's ever been written that has kind of the same idea. This is, this is an amazing sentence. We're just going to read it together, and you can admire the strangeness of it. The sentence is, only the fool would take trouble to verify that his sentence was composed of 10 A's, three B's, four C's, four D's, I'll go fast through the rest, 46 C's, 16 F's, four G's, 13 H's, 15 L's, two, yeah, no, it's 15 I's, two K's, nine L's, four M's, 25 N's, 24 O's, five P's, 16 R's, 41 S's, 37 T's, 10 U's, 8 V's, 8 W's, four X's, 11 Y's, 27 commas, 23 apostrophes, seven hyphens, and last but not least, a single exclamation point. 
Now, what makes this sentence so amazing is that it describes itself, right? It says, only the fool would take trouble that his sentence is, to verify the sentence is composed of 10 A's. Well, if you look through and you count the A's, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten A's. Three B's. Okay, count the B's, and there's three B's. Four C's. You count them up, and there's four C's. And I'm not going to go through the other twenty-three letters, but every single letter tells you how many of it is in the sentence. And if you just imagine trying to write this sentence, it would be so hard to write. Because you make one change, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, it's not eight Vs, it's nine Vs. But you just replaced an eight with a nine. And so now there's one less G and two extra Ns. So you have to go back to the Ns and change it. Say, oh, it's not 25 Ns, now it's 27 Ns. But that means you have to change the rest of the sentence. And so the only way to write this is to just, I don't, I, I don't even know how Lisa Ellis wrote this. Very hard sentence to create. And just to show you how hard, here's, here's an example, very simple. Digit one, appearances on this chart. Let's think, what could go there? What could go there in that spot? Let me, uh, 333, I love the number we have in here, beautiful. Um, let me just open up the chat real quick and think about what, would go, what could go in that spot on the chart? I see some one, one, nothing, two, two, one, nothing, nothing, one, 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 1.5. 1. You could just write the word ah, 51, paradox, paradox, paradox. Okay, cool. All right, well, I, I realize we haven't gotten all 333 answers, but we've got some nice nice possibilities in there. So I will uh, move forward. Now let's think, what could go there? Okay, let's imagine filling it in. Could we put in a one? That sort of makes sense, right? Because you look at, there's only one digit, one. So that, ah, but wait a second. I see some folks, I see Lillian doing one of these for me right now, because that doesn't make any sense. You can't do that because now there are two. There's no longer one digit one, there's two. Doesn't work. Okay, let's try something else. So two, right? So it's two, it should be two. Oh no, I'm seeing more of these. Two doesn't work because now there's only one. We replaced the second one, so it doesn't work anymore. What about, uh, what can we put there? How about that, 11? Okay, well, that doesn't really make sense. Actually, in binary, it does, because in binary, one, one means three. So it almost works, but we're not, we don't speak binary. We're not computers. So, okay, so that doesn't really work. What about zero? No, that, that makes no sense. That's, that's, that's what's known as gaslighting. That's pretend, denying something that's obviously true. Clearly, there's a one on the chart, so you can't say that. So it turns out there's nothing you can put here to make this chart true. It's just a contradiction. And I'll go quickly, because we are coming up on the end of time. Um, if you have one and two, it doesn't work any better because you put in a one, nope, that already fails. You put in a two, well, now you would need to put a one in the other spot, that doesn't work. You try putting in three, that doesn't work because there's not space for two ones, so you just can't do it. Okay, and so why does this matter? And good, this brings me finally, I'm gonna go back and explain that picture, the cartoon with the snake. Okay. 100, let's say 130 years ago. Um, you guys all remember, you were there. Uh, and as you recall, mathematicians really wanted to come up with a system for proving what was true, what was false. Everything would be proved. And you would take every single statement out there, every mathematical statement, and you'd come up with a system for saying, these ones are true, these ones are false, and you could prove it all. So you can see I've written some examples in, baby pigs are cute, true sentence. Dogs can smell time, false sentence, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Umbrellas look silly, true. Dancing caused World War II, false. Okay. Figure out, prove these are true, prove these are false. And then along comes somebody named Kurt Gödel, spelled G O D E L. The O has two little dots over it. Uh, and he came up with a sentence like this the sentence, I cannot be proven true. And so everybody looked at that and said, wait a second, okay. So if you prove it's true, then it must be true. But it says I can't be proven true. So that would be proving it false. So if you prove it's true, then you've just proved it false. Okay, well, okay, that, that's crazy. Okay, so we can prove it false, right? But if you prove that it's false, 
then it definitely can't be proven true because it's false. And that means you've just proved it's true because the statement says I can't be proven true. So if you prove it false, then okay, you're proving that it's true. It really can't be true, proven true. And if you find that a little bit confusing and head spinning, you're not alone. Mathematicians found this very upsetting. They said, why did you bring a snake into this party? And Kurt was like, I didn't bring the snake. The snake was here already. The snake was part of arithmetic. And here's why this upset people, because they've been working on this big project where they were gonna prove everything in mathematics, like a big tower, where fancy stuff like differential equations and Fourier analysis gets built on calculus, and that depends on algebra, and that depends on arithmetic, and that depends on really simple assumptions that cover all of mathematics. Just a few simple assumptions. And they were almost there. They felt like they were really close. And they were like, oh, this is gonna be a beautiful tower. We'll prove everything. By the way, what, what's the bedrock gonna be? What's gonna be in that bedrock? And they were like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll come up with something for the bedrock. We'll come up with something that all of math will depend on. And what Kurt Gödel showed is there is no good bedrock. There isn't a good system for proving everything. And that was very upsetting to everyone because they've been working at this point, it was 1930, they've been working. You guys, you guys remember, you were all there. They've been working for almost 50 years on this project. And then it gets proved that the project is never gonna work. You can never build a perfect tower. And so what happens is they say, okay, all right. So the tower fails and they start saying, okay, well, what can we prove true? What can we prove false? We can't do everything because we're gonna run into snakes, but can we prove some things true? And they came up with a machine for proving some things true and some things false. And that machine was called a computer. And so weirdly, it's one of my favorite stories in the history of math, because you start with this funny game of logic. You turn it into this big elaborate game where we're trying to sort true statements from false statements. The game fails, so it doesn't work anymore. You can't sort true statements from false ones. Not all of the statements anyway. But then from that comes the computer. And Alan Turing's work, he, he was a very careful reader of Gödel and, and these other logicians. And so to me, that's one of the weirdest things in math is you go chasing crazy ideas, you go on these weird adventures and suddenly it helps you do useful things. The adventure just seems silly, but you come back having invented the computer. And that is our final adventure. These are my uh, three books, if you're interested. The red and the blue one are uh, available now. The yellow one comes out in April and is, it actually is, this is a, an accurate drawing. The yellow one is gonna be taller than the other two. So why not do a tall book? Um, and I had fun hearing from you guys in chat. I realized it was hard to get your voice heard because there are so many of us here. Um, if you wanna get in touch with me, please feel free. I am, uh, my website is mathwithbaddrawings.com and my email is just mathwithbaddrawings at gmail.com. Um, and I love hearing from students. So feel free to send me an email, say hi. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoy speaking with you and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day doing your competitions. <laughs>